My name is David, and this is The Big Shut-In. It is Wednesday, the 20th of May, day 67 since my family and I went into quarantine. And today's conversation is really something else. I spoke to my friend Kalik, and Kalik and I met when we were working together on an outdoor arts festival. Um, this is maybe 10 years ago. And since then, his career has uh, taken a really interesting left turn. Um, a few years ago, he started working as a technician in the medical examiner's office here in New York City. And I'll let him tell you the details of what his day to day is, but basically he's in charge of collecting um, people's bodies after they die and labeling them, processing them, storing them, uh, and also assisting the medical examiners performing autopsies. And this was kind of an amazing conversation because I think we're all thinking very hard about healthcare, healthcare workers, and what it's like for the people who are intaking all of the thousands of people who are becoming fatally ill with this virus. But very, very few of us are thinking about what happens afterwards to the people who don't recover and the people who are taking care of them then. It's something I hadn't really thought about. And as you'll hear, it's a big project. There's a lot going on. And I, um, and listen, I'm, I'm going to get right into it. So this is Kalik. So how, how are you? Let me start there. How are you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm mentally and physically drained, literally. But I'm like, I'm hanging in there, man. You know, at the end of the day, I still got to get this, this job done. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm happy. I'm happy because I'm seeing, uh, you know, this thing is starting to clear up, but, uh, I'm just like physically and mentally drained really and truly. And that's because we've been putting a lot of hours in and pretty, that's pretty much where I'm at. <laughs> tell, well, tell me, wh- what is your job exactly? What do you, what do you do and where do you do I work, it? I work for the office, the chief medical examiner's office. I'm a, um, I'm a FMT, which stands for, for forensic mortuary technician. And uh, my job details consist of uh, pretty much retrieving uh, bodies from anywhere, from uh, homicide scenes, uh, hospitals, <laughs> car accidents, you name it. Anything you looking on the TV, you're pretty much responsible for it. And also performing autopsies. So it's either I'm on the truck making uh, pickups or I'm with a, a paired up with a doctor doing autopsies. How the hell did you get into that? Uh, you know what? It was... It was weird. Like, I, I just I applied for the position. I actually applied for that, and I applied for um, MTA to drive the MTA bus. Both of them contacted me at the same time. Because <laughs> <laughs> those are the only two choices. It's either drive right. a bus or cut right. open dead people. Two different, yeah. But, you know, I was, like, I was thinking about it. I was going towards uh, MTA because they were paying more. But then I was thinking about it. I'm like, hmm, I'm like, you know, this would probably be the last opportunity that I actually, you know, be able to experience something like this. I mean, did you ever have ambitions to be a doctor or to, I mean? Nothing in this field at all. Like literally no part of my life would I ever even thought about the medical field at all, at all. Like, like dealing with dead people is something that has been a big fear my entire life. And I don't like the idea of being afraid of something and, you know, not being able to conquer it. There was just something I was just like, let me just get into it and see what it's about and whatever. And I got into it and fell in love with it. Like the more I'm working and working, I'm starting to learn more uh, of uh, how the human body operates, how it works, things you don't want to put in your body. And I'm seeing the effects of it because I'm inside now and I'm seeing what's happening. So it's like, I've been learning so much. I ended up falling in love with the job. So how how long have you been doing this? 
Uh, November will make two years. Let me let me ask you a really ignorant question. Mm-hmm. Who ends up at the Emmy's office? Like, why does a body go? Th- why does a, a person? Let's let's call them people. They're people, right? Well, yes. Why does a person end up there? Every, rather than any, going directly to a funeral home or to okay, uh, so we know. provide we provide a free service to the city, right? So this 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 uh, service is pretty much we collect anywhere where there's death in the five boroughs. We're responsible for it if the family cannot provide a funeral home. So as far as a funeral home not taking uh, a decedent, that's mainly on the family. So if the family can't afford to make funeral arrangements on the spot, that's where we come in and we'll hold it. And we provide that. A lot of people don't know that we provide that free service to the city. So we'll, we're, it's mandatory for us to anywhere where there's death to be there and pick up the body and whatever and, and handle it. Well, okay, that's interesting because you hear a medical examiner, you think of homicides or pe- people, you know, that too. We handle fire. Or, but but it's not just that; it's also uh, anything, anything, anybody, where yeah. the, any and everything. Once there's death involved, we're on it. Like, it's, it's like five, it's, five boroughs. Yeah. Where's the office? We have one on uh, on Winthrop Street. In Albany, we have one on 30th in Manhattan, 30th and 1st Avenue. And the next one is, uh, I don't know if you know, Queens Hospital in, uh, in Queens. It's like we're on the same campus as Queens Hospital. And wh- where do you work? You, you work in the Manhattan office? Queens. But right now, we bounce through all boroughs right now. Like, it's, it's no longer like I'm, like, I just report to Queens in the morning and then we push out from there. H- how long is... um? Is is a decedent? That's a nice word. I'll use that word you used. Yeah. How long is a decedent generally uh, enjoying your hospitality? <laughs> let's say <laughs> before somebody comes and picks them up, or they move on somewhere else. We uh-huh. on a normal on a normal running day, and we will hold the body for like months until you know the family can figure it out. And worst case scenario, they don't come back for the body, which happens uh, frequently. And what we do is we uh, we take the 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 seasons to Pottersville and give them a proper burial. So we definitely handle everyone's case, like, you know, like his uh, personal own, you know? So p- paint me a picture of sort of what the the routine and uh, was like before. The day before? Before, yeah. Okay. So where we would be coming in, like, let's just say on my shift, uh, five Six bodies might come in. Like for me, if you bring a body in, we have to check it in. So there's a whole routine of things, that, like protocols that has to go through with each person. And each, each case has to be handled in the same exact manner. So that way we have no errors on our end. Because, you know, these are people loved ones. We have to handle them with care still. Now they're telling you 30 bodies is coming in at one time. So on- we're, talking, we're talking in terms of volume of... Just volume okay. of death that you're seeing, you're, you, it's like five times more bodies Way coming more. through your office. We have guys that's been work, that work 9-11 that said this is not even, this is a million times worse than 9-11. Like this, this is something like, I can't, I can't even explain to you the amount of bodies that I've seen. Like we usually keep all these cases in our morgue, but now it's so much cases now. We have like a big open place in Brooklyn. We call it the BCP, it's a body collection point. Where it's just like we have trailers and trailers just stacked, and we're holding everything for pretty much until the family can figure out what they want to do. Trailers, trailers. Where? Just in a parking lot somewhere? It's not like a, I don't even know if I if I should share. Well, don't tell me exactly where, but just yeah. like get, well, paint like the picture for like me. A, like a loading dock where ships pull up, and it's pretty much like all those containers. The containers you see that's usually on. On the ships, we have those indoors loaded. We and we have some outdoors that eventually make their way indoors. But everything's like properly refrigerated. Everything's like the way it needs to be, pretty much. Man, so I've never seen nothing like this before in my life. But a lot of people like it's crazy. A lot of people speak to me and they ask me, "Is it real? Like, is this really going on?" I'm like, "Man, if you only know, like thousands of bodies." came in like i'm like i'm like i literally watched them every day one by one thousands like thousands and thousands of bodies like it's unreal it's unreal 
It is, it is unreal. I mean, how does how does that make you feel then when you see people on the internet, you know, saying it's a hoax or it's just the flu or <laughs> I don't I don't feel like wearing a mask. I cannot explain to you how disturbing it is, man. On our end, it's so disturbing, man, because it's like you know we're actually putting the hard work in, man. All the essential workers, even down to the person that's serving your coffee, man. Like we're out here, you know, risking our health. You know, to have for, for everyone else out there to have someone else just say, "Oh man, you know, they're not going to take it serious." When like it's it's really that serious, like it's really really that serious. Right now, it's calmed down, but at one point it was insane. I'm like, literally, when I tell you, like it it, it looked like someone just hit a switch and thousands of people just dropped all at the same time. So it's like now you have. Like, we're, our phone is going off the hook. Like, imagine someone telling you, yo, we have 30 people right now that just dropped at the same time and a small team, and we need all of it to be picked up, you know? It's, 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 it's man, that's, it's hard to, like, give you a, it's just, it's, it's crazy, man. How, how fast, how did that ramp up? Like, was, was it an increase or was it just, like, one day boom? <laughs> Literally, one day boom. Like, we were, so what happened was, so, for, all right. So what happened was for us now, we were we weren't treating the situation as serious as it needed to be treated in the early stages because we were already getting COVID cases coming in and we were still performing autopsies on them. We don't perform autopsies on them anymore, but unless it's a homicide. So we were still like we were directly handling these bodies and we weren't like taking it as serious as we should have been because, you know, like you're watching the media and all that, you know, Trump is saying it's a hoax, it's, uh, you know. So it didn't, we didn't really take the take it as serious. And then it's like literally one week in March, just all of a sudden, just we got a heavy volume of just cases just started kicking in. We were like, yo, the truck went out and it stayed out. It came in, dropped off, and it was just back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, man, like, what's really going on? Like, is that, it was busy this today. And then the next day, it was worse. And then to the point where we were pulling people out of the autopsy room to, to do truck work, to to retrieve, to retrieve bodies because it was coming in so frequently. It was insane. Like, we just had to just, like, on the spot just deal with it. And no one was really prepared for it. So it's like a lot of people had stuff going on in their personal lives that they had to break. You know, people have children they have to attend to. There was a lot of stuff that was going on at the time. So, for like, for our, for us now, man, it was bad. It was really, really bad. Really, really bad. And, yeah. What kind of, I mean, if these are recently dead people, right, they're still contagious, right? So yeah. what kind of precautions do you guys have to take when you're handling these bodies and dealing with them? And this is this is the messed up part. In the beginning, we weren't, we weren't just like dressing the way we needed to be. So we were going into these homes with our regular uniform on and just we were wearing our uh, basic PPEs, masks, gloves. And things of that nature, but we weren't really gowning up in the beginning, so we were like directly hands on physically dealing with these cases. And thank God, none of us got no one on our, our team got sick, so that's that's <laughs> a blessing. But we were literally directly going into these homes where people were self quarantining and retrieving these cases, so like it's that's that's pretty much what we were, what we were dealing with. And uh, yeah, so right now, what we do now. If we're handling the cases, certain cases we uh we put on a Tyvek suit and uh, gloves, masks, and a face shield. So that's what we do now. But in the beginning, we weren't even ready for it. Is it hard to? I mean, it must be. This I mean, this seems petty, maybe. It must be uncomfortable to be working like that all day and all night in that kind of heavy yeah. gear, isn't it? Yeah, it's it because. It, it, so here it is, like the Tyvek suit, there's not really much breathing room in it. So like we're in a, someone's basement. Like I had a case, I was in a basement and like all the windows were closed. He was already decomposed and uh, they, they, he came up as possible COVID on our end. So he was like, he was a hoarder and like he was in the, in like in the back in, in a bathroom and to get to him, it's like you have to climb so much stuff. And it's like, we literally like redecorated this whole basement literally just to just get to him so it's like now nah, imagine like i'm someone tell you hey man i need you to rearrange my whole home in a tyvek suit on a hot day you know 
So it was like it's it's, it's just, it was rough as far as like the conditions while wearing this gear. How how does somebody you said he he came he came up as possible COVID? Yeah. How, so, how does that happen? Who makes that determination? How do you know? Uh, that's that's so. Sometimes people come in like you know they might the family might have told the doctor like, you know he's been complaining about sickness like possible things that you know the symptoms of the COVID. So that's where when when you do die, they'll make it like as possible COVID, but it's not for sure. We're not sure until we get it and you know do our thing. But it's it's always going to be possible if no doctor ruled it off. You know, like if they didn't go to the hospital and a doctor told you yes, you have COVID and you have all the symptoms and then died, it's possible. The possibility that you had it. And do you do you test them? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. We don't really do much handling with them after they they go on. We don't really do too much opening of the the pouches. We try to keep them sealed and contained. We don't really want to, you know. Because I wonder that it. too. I mean, it seems to me that the numbers that are being published of how many people had this, how many people died from it, must be really low, right? Because yeah. there must be tons of people who are dying for this who are not getting officially tested for it. Yes, yes, definitely. Because there's there's people that might have, you know, that definitely went out that we weren't sure of, you know, because they didn't, we never got they, they never got tested. So that's definitely a possible. Highly likely, pretty much. How, I mean, how many, what percentage would you say of the cases <laughs> of, that come in sealed have been like our, <laughs> are for sure tested positive and are just, or just assumed to be positive? Like, uh, I'd say, uh, I give it a roughly 60% that were positive that we, we can say for sure that we know. And the rest are just like up in the air. What are you doing with, if if there's a body that is known to be contagious or yes, they're separated. But how do you? What are you going to do with those bodies? Same scenario. No one, no one gets treated differently. No one gets treated differently at all. Because it's like it's you know what? A lot of people has been walking up to me and asking me, especially when I'm in uniform, like, are we burning the bodies? And I had to ask. Like, I think my I had my I had. A, I couldn't take it no more. I had to just ask one person. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, if, if you came, you know, you're going through, you lost a loved one. Let's say your mom or whatnot. You came to retrieve the body to go to a funeral home. And my response to you was that I burnt your mother. Like, how would you react to that? And he was like, I'd lose my mind. I'm, I'm like, sorry, I'm laughing, but. Yeah. <laughs> it's for real. Because I'm like, okay, so, well, just remember your reaction to that is, would be any normal person's reaction to that. So. There's no way we can get away with harming someone's loved ones. Even though they got the virus and whatnot, this is, these are people's loved ones that, you know, still need to be handled with care. So we, we, we definitely do it the right way. Everyone, no one gets treated differently. As far as, only as far as separation goes, we keep them separated, but uh, no one's mistreated. That's why it's, like, very important that, you know, that why we're working so hard to retrieve all these bodies because, these a lot of these cases are coming out of hospitals so it's like even though covid has slowed up in the hospitals people are forgetting like all right those bodies are still there you know they're not just getting up and walking out of the hospital after they die they're stacked up there and they need to be out of there escorted properly out of there you know so like i'll show you where the chaos comes in on our end because we're coming into hospitals where they're hiring a lot of people who've never dealt with this type of thing. They never handle a dead person. They don't know anything about dead people. So it's like a lot of the packaging is wrong. A lot of the, the numbers are wrong. Like a lot of like seals, just a lot of stuff are just incorrect. So like we, we can't touch something if it's incorrect on their end until they get it right. So now imagine we get to a hospital. We're responsible for picking up 50 decedents off of a truck. So now, one by one, each case, now we got to go by, look at the number, then have them go into their system and find the proper numbers for them, then repouch. So it's like one by one, while there's still, you know, 49 other cases that needs to make its way off the truck and in our truck and retag and seal and repouch, repouch and we put them in our bag. So it's like, imagine now <laughs> these, are, these people are heavy, you know? And it's, the weight isn't like evenly portioned out. So it's not like lifting a dumbbell where it's like the weight is distributed evenly. 
it's like it's an like awkward lifting. So it's like it's 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 crazy, man. So it's like it's a lot of a lot of times a lot of these hospitals currently right now are getting it together, but it was a mess, man. Like I've went into trailers where I open up the the trailer and there's like a body just on the floor, you know, in a pool of, of mess. Like, you know, I'm like, man, like if these people family seen this, like it would be it would never they would never let this just go down so easily, you know? But I, I understand because a lot of these people that are doing this have no experience on how to properly move a defeated, you know, without them getting injured. They don't know how to do this thing. But, you know, we're in a pandemic and they need the extra help. They need it. Not to say, well, you know, we, we can just find a professional. Like, we, they need it. It's like, I think it's like more out of desperation. It's like, well, all right, who's willing to do this? Because the average person is not going to get up out their house and go handle a case that's killing people. So, it's, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was rough on Iron Man. Man. So yeah. you, you said at the beginning that things are starting to mellow out a little bit? Yeah, on the hospital end, right? As far as, like, people dying. We're not getting as much calls, like, volume as we were before. But uh, it, the work didn't decrease on our end. The work kind of increased. Because now, remember, all these trailers that uh, that were stacked up in the five boroughs now has to make its way to us. So now we're we're pretty much retrieving each each hospital. We're dealing with each hospital one by one, trying to offload all their trailers. So like yeah, everything you've been seeing, we're collecting everything one by one until we have everything out of all the five boroughs. <laughs> I this is one of the most insane conversations I've ever had in my life. I so what if tell tell me a little bit about your life right now. Like where are you staying in all this? Okay, so my life right now consists of getting up 6 a.m. to be at work for 7 o'clock. And 7 o'clock, I'm in my uniform already. Then we make our way to Brooklyn for 8 o'clock. So we get our briefing. We get assigned a team, which consists of uh, our team lead. Pretty much they have all the paperwork and stuff of all the decisions that we need and what the numbers should look like. So, you know, like pretty much everything that what should be on each decision. So we know if, if it's okay to take and we get uh, a team of either the Navy or the Army. We get our normal days. It's a two-man team. So now that COVID started, we have the military assisting us right now in the Navy. Tell me, about the, tell me about the soldiers and the soldiers and sailors you're working with. Like The soldiers, man, and we have a, there's the soldiers. We got the soldiers and the DMARC team. And pretty much they've been amazing, man. Like these kids, it's a lot of young kids that's never done anything like this in their life and you know there you there's no like even flinch of fear on them i was speaking to a soldier this morning and he was talking to me and he's like yeah man like i was asking him like i was going to give him like he was pretty much doing a job and i wouldn't do it that way i knew a simpler way i was going to tell him but he started talking to me and he's like man yeah man i've been doing this for so much week man i'm a pro by now i just left him i didn't want to <laughs> ruin that moment for him. i was like yeah man but it should show you how much that they've been doing it, you know, for him to have that attitude about it. It's like he's really been doing a lot. Like he's hands on been handling thousands of cases. So like imagine you coming from never interacting with any dead body to handling thousands of cases. So I'm like, he definitely he definitely earned the right to say that. So I didn't even say anything to him. I was like, You were right about that, man. <laughs> Are you um where do you live? Do you live alone? Do you you live with your family? Yeah, I, um, I live in a I live in a family house, and I live on the top floor. Pretty much, it's like it's like three apartments, and I have my own apartment. Because I was wondering if you know you had to take precautions about. Yeah, so like coming seeing your family house, and yeah, my grandmother is downstairs, and my aunt, and pretty much is like they're like they're watching the news, and oh my god, like I am like the most. <laughs> I'm so I'm so contagious to them. Like, as soon as I get to the door, like they have uh like all types of sprays. They spray me completely down under my shoes. They take them. They spray my shoes down. Take my clothes from me. Like they we, and they're 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 uh they're wearing like gloves and like you know PPE regular PPE they're wearing and they 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 await my arrival on a daily basis. God bless them, man. That's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so they're they're not playing around with me at all. I promise you that. So are I mean, 
are you guys talking about i mean i've been hearing a lot about the idea of a second wave either a third yes. wave yes are you guys talking about that and planning for what yes, might happen in the fall or tell me about that so we haven't really like spoken much on it but there's a lot of talk going around because it's like it's not that much like time for these conversations at the moment because we're still trying to handle the current situation well, we have been like briefly speaking on a possible second wave, this thing, and we're we're guessing like fall, like around fall, and that's just that's just a guess. That's not even like guaranteed. But you know, is we gotta make that you know precaution. We gotta handle it the right way in case it does happen. You know, we won't have a second situation where we weren't prepared the first time because we should have been prepared the first time. We got all the uh, <laughs> early warnings. But we weren't prepared. Do you think you're going to stick with this job for long term? Is this your career now? Uh, right now, yes. Unless something comes along that uh, changed my mind money wise. But I'm I'm literally in love with the work. I'm in love with the team. Like I have a great team. Like obviously, like we get up every day. It's not because we're getting paid the <laughs> greatly like the most amount of money, but it's more for for the love of it. So. I definitely yeah. see myself with this company for a while. Whatever, whatever they're paying you, they should triple it right now. I don't, I don't, I don't know, know what, what it is. I don't care what it is. I cannot imagine, imagine doing what you're doing. I don't even like if there's a dead mouse in the basement. Like I don't like picking it up, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, definitely takes a. I just said a term, but it's just like you know, a lot of people we have that my coworkers came in scared, but it's like anything else. You do it enough. You're going to get good at it. So it's like for me, when I first started the job, it was rough for me because smells, like I couldn't handle these smells. So I used to walk around with a eucalyptus oil and I used to put it in my mask. And everyone used to laugh at me like, so yo, what are you going to do when that runs out? I'm like, I'm going to buy some more. And then one day it did run out and I, I didn't have anything, like nowhere to buy it. And we had the case right in front of us. So I had to stomach it in. And from since that day, I've never used it anymore. So Did, they, touch- did they call you the koala? <laughs> There's a missed no. opportunity there. <laughs> <laughs> but what um, I was going to say to so backtrack a little bit. Please, yeah. So uh, remember you saying we should get paid so much, right? So check this out. It's, this is the crazy part. A lot of people do have no clue what we're doing. They don't know anything about our organization. They don't know nothing we're doing. So when this whole thing started, like you hear like a lot of people saying, you know, they're praising the healthcare workers. Which is good. The hospitals, you know, they've definitely been through it just like us. But a lot of things are not, like, accessible to us. So it's like, here it is, I'd be talking to a nurse, and they was like, yeah, they get 50% off on this, 50% off on that, a lot of money off on gas, this and that. Like, it's so much stuff that's being offered to all, every, all the central workers and not us because they have no idea that we even exist. So it's like, I went on to a, a website, I think it's ID Me, and they had a list of People, army men, everyone, pretty much everyone that's assisting us doing our job are getting all these benefits and we're not getting it. So it's like, there's like, we, it's not even an option. Like, we're getting slight stuff, you know? But a lot of stuff, like, we just started getting food recently. Like, we weren't getting food at all from anywhere. But all the hospitals, like, even on uh, on the website that, you know, was giving out gas discounts, that st- things that we desperately needed. Like they were recognized in uh nine one one operated and not us. So it's like there's so much stuff that uh we're not getting and it's more because a lot of people just they go straight to, you know, the hospital, the healthcare, the nurses, you know, the the the, the physician assistant. Like those people, even the people they were even giving people um that were bringing like restocking the soda machines and stuff, like all types of stuff and they, all that stuff, you know, the work we're putting in to see that is like hurtful. Trust me when I say it. it's hurtful, man. Because it's like people have no idea what we're what we're doing. They don't know what we're seeing. You know, a lot of this stuff like it's like it's, 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 it brings trauma sometimes seeing what we're seeing. And then now it's like we get no recognition behind it. It's like man, it's like some, that's why I say we're doing it for the love because it's not we're not getting recognized for it at all. So it's like I seen the mayor. Uh, he spoke on us and I was so thankful like man like at least someone knows what we're doing you know uh, well, I'm, I'm awfully grateful that somebody's doing what you're doing 
Uh, uh, man, listen, take take care of yourself, man. Stay stay safe. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. My name is David Hoffman, and this is The Big Shut-In. I produce the show, post-production by Stephen DeLaro. It's a production of Race Car Radio, racecarradio.com. If you have feedback for me, or you have a story that you think I should hear, please feel free to reach out, thebigshutin at racecarradio.com. Race Car Radio is a division of Citizen Race Car, Applied Imagination. <laughs>